Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to praise you this morning that even in these strange times you enable us to have fellowship together using the technology and communication methods that are available to us. Thank you Lord for the members of our church who are involved in contributing and pulling together these services for us all to enjoy and for Brian who keeps us updated with the church community every single day. Thank you, Lord, for the wide-reaching nature of the online church, allowing us to spread your word to new households and perhaps to people who have never heard the good news of Jesus before. Thank you, Lord, for our essential workers, for all the work they are doing during this pandemic, and thank you for the incredible amounts of money that have been raised for the NHS by people like Captain Tom Moore as he celebrated his 100th birthday on Thursday. Finally, I thank you, Lord, that you are in control of the coronavirus all across the world, and we can take comfort in the fact that you know how and when it will come to an end. Until then, let us rejoice wherever we are watching this service together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi everybody, hope you're all keeping well. We've all had a good week, um, lots of fun, and maybe being a wee bit of work as well. And um, We're going to do the next part of our missionary story today, all about William Carey. And hopefully you remember last week that William was a cobbler. He lived in England over well over 200 years ago, and he'd become a Christian. And not only was he doing his work as a cobbler every day, but now he was studying God's word and he was learning to be a minister. He was really eager to go out and to share the gospel with um, the people in his village. You know, the people in the village began to realise that William was really on fire for God, that he knew a lot about the Bible, and they asked him to preach in their church. But soon other villages were hearing about William, and he was going out and he was actually preaching in other villages as well. He was heading out in the rain, the snow and the sunshine, and he was going all around the countryside telling people about God. Nothing made him happier than to preach God's word and to tell others about Jesus. But very often William was sad because as we found out last week, he had ha taken a real passion in his heart for people in the world who didn't know anything about God. And while he was studying about these countries, he had made himself a little globe out of leather and he made himself a big map to put up in his workshop um, as he worked as a cobbler. And as he looked at the globe and he looked at the map, his eyes would fill with tears as he thought about the people in the world who didn't know anything about God and didn't know about God's love. But he kept on making his shoes and he kept on teaching and preaching and doing the job that God had given to him, but he would still be preaching about the need to share the gospel around the whole world. You know, one man said to him, William, what, what on earth are you doing this for? Just stick to your business of being a cobbler and never worry about preaching. But William said to him, my business is to work for God. I only make a man's shoes to pay for my expenses, to pay my way. But another man that William worked for was very kind and he was a Christian man. And he said to William, what do you earn every week doing all your, your cobbling? And William said, I earn nine or 10 shillings a week. And the man said to him, look, William, I will pay you nine and 10 shillings a week. And then you can devote all your energies 
to being a preacher and to study and to be a minister. And that's what William did. He set about studying to be a minister and um, preaching the gospel around all the villages where he was. But as he preached around these, these towns and villages, he couldn't stop thinking about the people in the world who didn't know anything about God. We must do something about it, he would say to his friends. We must send missionaries out to tell people about God. But his other friends who were preachers were older than him and they just shook their heads and they said, William's just a young, enthusiastic young man. He's got big ideas, but there's nothing that we can do. But he kept on saying that we must do something. And one day he was at a minister's meeting and they said, um, is there something that we need to discuss? What can we discuss today? And William stood up straight and tall and he said again, can we discuss this man? God, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's talk about these words. Don't you think he was telling his disciples and us to go out and preach the gospel in every country? Well, the leader of the meeting was not very pleased. He was very cross with William and he said, sit down, young man, sit down. If God wants to convert the heathen, he'll do it without our help. In other words, if God wants to save people, he can do it without us. He doesn't need us to help him. William was so sad and he sat down again. That verse, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That verse was going round and round in his head and he thought, but how will these people know about this? What can we do? What can I do? And he thought and prayed about it. And one day, another man that he knew came to him and said, William, why don't you make a leaflet to go out round the churches? You can write it and we'll get it printed. And William said, look, I would love to do that, but I don't have the money to write a leaflet like that or get it published. And the man said, look, if you write it, I'll give you the money to print it. And again, God knew that, or William knew that God was working in all of this um, because God had sent someone to help him. So William studied long and thought long about it and he finally had written a leaflet that could go out around the churches to encourage people to send missionaries out to other lands. He wrote about the millions of people who knew nothing about God. About this time the preachers invited William to speak to them again and he stood up and he preached with all his heart. He told them that God wanted them to take the message of Jesus, uh, Jesus' love to people in every land and he said something that's quite well known. Maybe some of the grown-ups know um, this little saying from, from William Carey. He said, God is faithful. We must expect great things from God. We must attempt great things for God. In other words, we must believe that God can do amazing things and we have to go out and serve him. You know, when William finished preaching, it was very still in the room, and very quiet. And William thought, Surely something's going to happen here. Their hearts must be touched. But they didn't. They just started chatting amongst themselves again about whatever it was they wanted to chat about. And they weren't talking about what William was, was preaching on at all. And they started to get ready to go home. William was so disappointed that he grabbed the arm of his friend, um, a man called Andrew Fuller. And he said, sir, isn't anything going to be done? And then it happened. Andrew's heart was touched and he knew too that God wanted them to do something. And the two men stood up and started to earnestly ask the other preachers, the other older men, to do something. And at last their hearts were changed and they decided they were going to start a missionary society. It was amazing and William was so pleased. But who was going to be their first missionary? Who were they going to send and where would he go? Well, they'd heard about a man called John Thomas. He was a doctor, a Christian doctor who'd been to India and they asked him to come and tell them all about that country and he did. He told them about the millions of boys and girls and men and women who had never heard of Jesus and he said to them, more than anything, I would love to go back to that country to be a missionary but I need someone to go with me. Well, William sat on the edge of his seat as you can imagine and the tears were streaming down his face. I would love to go and then he felt that God was telling him, yes, William, I want you to go. And William stood right up in that meeting and he said, I will go with Dr. Thomas. Dr. Thomas was so excited at the news, he jumped up and gave William a big hug. They were so excited and the other ministers were finally so excited as well. So one day they held a special service 
um, they laid hands on William and they prayed for him and they promised that they would never forget to pray for him and to help him as long as they lived. So William Carey, who had been a poor village shoemaker, was chosen to be the first missionary to be sent from England out to India. And next time we'll hear all about his long and dangerous sea voyage and we'll hear about some of the amazing things that God did with this very ordinary man's life out in India. And you know, God can do amazing things with our lives as well. Maybe some of you will be missionaries one day out in other countries or maybe um, you can be a missionary just where you are in your own little simple way. You can do something right now. Let's just say a wee prayer together. Dear Lord God, thank you again for all our boys and girls. Thank you for each one of them. I pray that you bless them this week. You keep them safe. Watch over them and bless them and keep their family safe as well. And I pray that you would go before us in all that we do. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. <laughs>
Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, uh, this day you've given us, uh, a different day, Lord, a day set aside to worship you and a day to take physical rest. And even amidst these unusual times, Lord, we just thank you that we can draw aside uh, to worship together uh, and to praise your name. And Lord, as we meet at this time, we are aware that so many are going through difficult times uh, because of this Awful virus, Lord. So many people are in hospital. So many people are in care homes who are unwell. We just pray, Lord, that you would be with them and that you would strengthen them and that you would bring them back to health and strength. Remember also many who are concerned about their jobs and concerned about their employment and their future, who are worrying about these things, Lord. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would give them peace and that they, Lord, would rely on you. Lord, that they would remember how you look after, Lord, the lilies in the field, how you look after the birds in the air, and so much more, Lord, you look after us. Father, at this time, we just remember all those who are working, Lord, in hospitals and in care homes, uh, the doctors, uh, the nurses, the, the ambulance drivers, those who make food, Lord, those who do anything at all, Lord, in those places, Lord, where there is where there is danger at this time. We just pray, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would strengthen them, that you would give them courage each day and that you would keep them safe, Lord. Lord, I pray that they would rely on you, that they would know you, Lord, as their friend and their saviour at this difficult time. So many others, Lord, are, are, are working as well. And we think of those, Lord, who, who are working along the, the food chain, Lord, and providing food for us at this time. We remember the farmers, Lord, on the, on the land working away. Uh, remember those who are working in, in food production and food factories and the likes of bakeries, uh, those, Lord, who are who are transporting these necessary goods and those, Lord, who are working in shops, who are exposing themselves to large numbers of the public. We just pray that you would protect them, that you would bless them. And, Lord, may they be appreciated by us. May we be courteous towards them uh, as they do this work. Uh, at this time also, Lord, we, we remember those who are unwell with, with other issues, Lord, those who have, have other medical problems, uh, those who have different issues, Lord, in their lives that have had to be parked at this time, Lord, uh, just because there is such a strain on, on medical services. We just pray, Lord, that you would give these people comfort, Lord, and at the right time, Lord, that the treatments that they need would be available and that they, Lord, would indeed, Lord, uh, be, be cured. Just be with them and give them give them peace of mind. Remember too, Lord, our politicians, we pray for great wisdom. We thank you that Boris Johnson uh, is back at work and that he has recovered from this virus. We just pray, Lord, that you would give him uh, and, and all of his ministers, Lord, who are in charge of this situation, you would give them great wisdom, uh, that they would make the right decisions at the right time, Lord, uh, and, and that, that this problem would be mitigated, Lord. What we pray for them, Lord, we also pray for our own uh, government ministers here in Northern Ireland. We remember our First Minister and our Deputy First Minister, and especially our Health Minister, Lord. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would be close to him. Lord, there is a great burden on his shoulders, Lord. Uh, and we just pray, Lord, that he would, he would, Lord, use, Lord, the, his, 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 his wisdom, Lord, uh, to, 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 to the best, Lord, and that he would make the best decisions for our land. Uh, and Lord, may he and all those other ministers, Lord, may they take, may they, Lord, may they just take counsel from you and, and your word. Lord, we, we have much also to thank you for. We thank you for the beautiful weather that we've had over the past few weeks. And we thank you also for the rain that's come along, Lord, to, Lord, to nourish the crops and continue growth uh, so that we might have food. We thank you for that. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for those who have come to know you. Uh, for the first time as, as their personal saviour as well, Lord. So much to thank you for. 
And Lord, we just pray as we continue on in worship that you would be with us, you would be in our midst. And Lord, we just long for the day that we're all together again in our respective places of worship, Lord. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 13. And it really is a powerful psalm. It's a psalm in which we trace the journey of David from the point of total despair, blackness and bleakness to a point where he is filled with praise and joy. And really that's such an important message for us all in these days, isn't it? That we can move from despair to praising the Lord, from darkness to the glorious light of God's blessing. So we're going to look at this in three parts. First of all, we're going to see David's pitiful lament in verses 1 and 2. And then David's turning point in verses 3 to 4. And then we'll finally see David's new outlook in verses 5 and 6. So let's begin with David's pitiful lament lament. Charles Spurgeon calls this the howling psalm and he calls it that because really we see David here in real anguish of heart and of spirit simply howling to God, uh, really pouring out uh, almost like a bitter heart to God, complaining to God, shouting at God. He has so much going on in his life that is weighing him down. It doesn't seem to be ending. And so he just screams at God. And four times in the first two verses, he repeats this phrase, How long? His problems are just weighing him down. And he sees no end to them at all. And in his despair, he howls at God. And Spurgeon actually says, how long do our days appear when our soul is cast down within us? And I think each one of us could say amen to that at the present time. Because when you have problems and worries and fears, and they don't seem to be going away, every day seems like a week, every week seems like a month. And I suppose this lockdown and this virus has been affecting us all that way, hasn't it? <laughs> you know, it seems to have been going on forever. And there doesn't seem to be any end to it. And so David here, as he's stuck in his problems, he issues a number of complaints to the Lord, four of them in particular. First of all, he says, How long will you forget me? He writes, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Things are so, so very bad that he just feels that God has completely and utterly forgotten about him. Uh, John Calvin remarks, when we are for a long time weighed down by calamities and when we do not perceive any sign of divine aid, this thought unavoidably forces itself upon us that God has forgotten us. And it's not just David that feels that way. Maybe many of you who are watching today are feeling that God has forgotten. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget us? How long will you leave us in this plight? How long will you leave us mired in this awful virus? God, how long will you forget us? But of course it's not true that God has forgotten David, or that God has forgotten any of his people. God knows all things. He knows the plight that David is passing through. And the great God has made marvellous promises to David in the past. He has promised that he's not going to forget him. Men might. Friends might fail him. God won't. And I know when you're passing through all kinds of difficulties that friends can seem to let you down, can't they? 
you have a loss in your family and for a while people gather round and then a few weeks later they all seem to have disappeared they all seem to have forgotten friends can promise to pray for you when you're facing illness and all kinds of problems and then you're left with the the feeling that after a little while they've forgotten they've moved on to somebody else but God never forgets his people and if you're a Christian let me reassure you God has not forgotten you today in the midst of this current pandemic the second cry that David issues is how long will you hide your face from me he feels that God has turned away from him that God has left him alone in the midst of his troubles and you know it must be awful to feel that way to feel that God has turned his face away that God is no longer smiling upon you that God is just unmoved and untouched by your plight look dear friend here's a piece of reassurance Jesus Christ the Son of God himself felt that way do you remember his cry of anguish from the cross my God my God why have you forsaken me and we get an explanation for that cry in that hymn that we sing so often our great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory and you see on the cross Jesus Christ took upon himself my sin he became my sin and he was punished for my sin and all the wrath of the father was poured out upon him and one part of that was that God is of purer eyes than to look upon iniquity and the father could no longer look upon the son and he had to turn his face away and look away and the son felt desolate desolate and he did it to save the likes of you and me so it is possible for the father to turn his face away but let me reassure you if you are a Christian God is not absent from you he has not turned his face away from you you feel God forsaken because you feel he's not smiling on you anymore and you wonder if he will ever smile on you again if he will ever bless you again you feel that he must somehow be angry with you and that's why there's no blessing there's no sense of his presence in these difficult days but he is not hiding his face from you why not because of what Christ did on the cross because Christ took all of your sin the father turned his face from Christ so that he will never have to turn his face away from you your God is never going to leave you alone your God is always watching over you my Christian brother or sister all of your sin is forgiven all of your sin was paid for by Jesus on that cross of shame and the God that you know personally in Jesus Christ is just longing to bless you he may ask you to walk difficult valleys but he is walking with you and watching over you every step of that journey David felt that God had forgotten about him that God had turned his face away but God did not do that but then there's a third complaint that David has how long must I wrestle with these sorrows is there in verse 2 how long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart 
all the day. You know, how long do I have to keep on turning over these sorrows, these pains in my heart? How long do I have to dwell on them, trying to make sense of them? They're crushing me. And I can't get them out of my mind. I can't stop them grasping my heart and squeezing my heart. How long do I have to come through all of this, says David to his God. He cries out in anguish. He cries out in bitterness. He cries out in anger. There's an old French proverb about sickness and other problems. The proverb says, they come on horseback and they go away on foot. And that's true, isn't it? Difficulties and problems can hit us like a bolt from the blue. And they linger a long time. This virus hit us suddenly. But it's going away very, 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 very slowly. Our sorrows, my friends, are like lingering guests. I'm sure you've all had people who come to visit. And to put it bluntly, they overstay their welcome. They're so dull, they're so boring, they're so negative, they're so difficult that you just would love them to go away and leave you, but they just sit on and stay on. I once had a friend many years ago who would call in to visit us. The children were very small at the time and he just never seemed to know when to go. He would sit into the wee hours of the morning. Thelma and I would be running up and down the stairs to look after sick children. And he would sit, and he would sit, and he would sit. He didn't know when to go home. Even when you brought him his coat, he just set it to the side of him. And, you know, our sorrows can be like that. And here's the thing about unwanted guests. The more you make of them, the more interest you show in them, the longer they stay. If I showed any interest at all in the conversation that this man was having, he would have sat for another hour. And it's the same with sorrows and troubles and worries. If you focus on them, they will stay around. If you focus on them, they will drag you down. If you make of them by constantly dwelling on them, they will overstay their welcome. And the danger for us in these days that is that we will spend so much time focusing on this virus, focusing on the problems, focusing on the fears, that we're just consumed by them. And all we can do is in anger cry out to God, How long? How long are we going to have to wrestle with these problems? How long before lockdown's lifted? How long before? And we just sink further and further into the mire. The fourth complaint that David had, How long will my enemy keep on winning? Look there in the last part of verse 2. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? You know, it adds to your pain and suffering if your enemy seems to keep on profiting. If bad folk prosper while good folk are suffering, it can cause you to scream out to God, Why? 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 How long is this going to go on for? So David here is so cast down that he simply howls out to God in frustration and in anger. And maybe that just sums up the way that you're feeling today. And if that's the case, it's so important that we move on now to see David's turning point in verses 3 and 4. You see the change of mood there? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. 
Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. There's a, a turning point here, a real turning point. Because having cried out to God in bitter frustration, David now focuses on something that he knows to be really true, really solid, really unchangeable. He focuses on the character of God and he then begins to pray to God in a more focused, considered way. He remembers who his God is and so he utters a prayer of genuine faith. You see what he says? He says, O oh Lord my God. He's actually using the personal name of God. That name, Yahweh, that was given to Moses. Moses, when he was confronted by the burning bush, when God was sending him to his people. Uh, Moses says, but who am I going to say has sent me? And God says, tell them Yahweh has sent you. I am who I am. That is the lovely personal name of God in the Old Testament. Orthodox Jews view that name as so holy that they can't say it. They miss the point. People of faith can call upon the name of God. People who know God personally can use that personal name. Their God is not a stranger to them the way he is a stranger to those who have never come to Christ. Their God is a personal God. They have a relationship with him. And, and David here calls Yahweh, he calls his Lord, my God. Isn't it lovely to be able to say, I know my God. I know my God in my Saviour, Jesus Christ. Because that's what being, being a Christian is all about. It's about knowing God. It's about having a relationship with God through Jesus. A real living relationship. And you see, when David reminds himself of who his God is, when he reminds himself of his personal relationship with God, he begins to seek God's face in real prayer rather than simply complaining to God. And that is the turning point in this psalm. And that is the turning point in David's attitude. He decides that he is really going to pray to him. And he remembers that his God has not forgotten him and cannot forget him. And look at the prayer that he offers. He's not saying, take away these problems, Lord. He's not saying, how long will my circumstances be hard for anymore? He says, light up my eyes. What he means by that is, he's saying to God, let me see you afresh, O oh my Lord, my God. Let me see things as they really are. Let me view my circumstances in the light that shines from you rather than looking at them the way the devil wants me to look at them. Let me see something of your purposes and your plans. I want to know more of you and more of your ways. He focuses on God and he prays to God for more of his presence and more understanding of his ways. And don't we need that today? I love the phrase that uh, Billy Graham's daughter used so often. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. But isn't that what we want to be praying today? Rather than focusing on the virus and its effects, rather than longing for <laughs> to be released from lockdown, rather than longing for the virus to go, should would not we be saying to our God, just give me 
Jesus. Just draw me into a closer relationship with my Saviour. I want to know more of you, my Lord. I want to get closer to you. That will be blessing for my soul. Oh, my dear saved brother or sister, focus on Jesus and his love. Ask him to reveal more of his Father to you today. And notice what he says here in this latter part of verse 3 and in verse 4. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice and I am shaken. He's saying, look, here's the way I feel, Lord. If I can't see more of you. If I can't know more of my Saviour, then I might as well be dead. But I don't want that. Because then my enemies and your enemies would gloat. Death is not the answer. More of you, my Lord. Seeing more of your character. Understanding more of your ways. That is the answer. When David prays like that. That is the turning point in this psalm. And then finally we move on to see David's new outlook in verses 5 and 6. You see this fresh commitment to sincere prayer results in a new, brighter outlook for David. But I have trusted in your steadfast love, he writes. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountiful, bountifully with me. Do you see how it's all changed? The despair and the darkness and the hopelessness and the anger of the first verses has changed into incredible peace and joy in his God. Talking to God has utterly changed David's attitude to his troubles. Notice the troubles haven't gone away. His circumstances haven't changed. But David has changed. Spurgeon puts it this way. The mercy seat has so refreshed the poor weeper that he clears his throat for a song. David trusts in God's steadfast love now. He's sure of it. He rejoices in it. And that, that phrase, steadfast love, it's one word in Hebrew. It's a word that means the covenant love of God. Because God, you see, took the initiative and he started the covenant. He came to Abraham and he said, I will be your God and you will be my people. God swore himself to be with his people forever and ever. Nothing but nothing can alter that. All of David's trials cannot destroy the promises of God. And so David is going to continue to trust in the promises of God. How much greater is it for those of us who are Christians today? For us, the new covenant or the renewed covenant is sealed with the blood of Jesus. God promised Abraham it would be an everlasting covenant. And Jesus sealed that promise with his own lifeblood. His death on the cross guarantees us God's presence and God's favour and God's forgiveness at all times if we will but come and repent and believe and trust in him. The covenant promises of our God can be trusted because Jesus Christ is utterly, utterly trustworthy. And so with David, we can rejoice in the salvation which God alone delivers. We can rejoice in the salvation that Jesus Christ has granted to all who come to him. In the midst of our troubles and our darkness, we can sing praise to Jesus Christ, our great Redeemer. We can lift up his name 
we can praise him. Uh, you know, verse 6, David says, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. God is no mean deity. Having to have little drops of blessing squeezed out of him by good works or good acts or sacrificial acts by his people. Our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has dealt bountifully with us because he has opened the very store room of heaven and he pours out blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon us his children day after day he blesses us with abundant blessing even in the midst of covid19 he is with us he is there to bless us with his presence to bless us with the knowledge of christ's death for us on the cross to bless us as we use this wonderful gift of prayer to bless us as we read his glorious infallible word he is blessing us we need not fear we need not despair our feelings of frustration and bitterness and anger and anxiety can be transformed into a real sense of peace and a real sense of praise when we focus on our Jesus and we really pray to him. But let me say this as I close. The great experience that David had in this psalm is an experience for the believer. If you have never come to Christ, if you have rejected his gospel offer of salvation, you can't know this peace. You can't know this joy. First of all, you have to come to Christ. You have to be transformed by his saving power. And then and only then can you follow this pathway that David followed. But if you are saved here today, do not sit worrying and fretting focusing on the problems get down on your knees look up to your loving God and pray to him asking to know more and more of Jesus more and more of his wonderful character because that's what will carry you through with a song of praise in your heart Let's pray together. O oh Lord, our God and our Redeemer, we confess freely before you that it's so easy to get down in these days. It's so easy to focus on the problems and the, the fears. It's so easy to feel such despair that we just want to howl at you and to blame you for our heartache, to shout at you and complain. But then we stop and we remember who you are. We remember your wonderful, wonderful promises. We remember that you put Jesus on the cross to die for us. And so we turn our faces to you in prayer. Not asking you to take away the problems. But asking you that we might see you more clearly. And know more of you in the midst of the problems. That Jesus would become ever more real to us. So that we would be filled with the peace of God that passes understanding. And filled with joy in our God. In our Saviour. That we would want to sing songs of praise. Because when we begin to count our blessings we find we cannot number them. Because you have been so very good to us. Oh, encourage us with these words, Lord God. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.